Hello! Welcome back to Starlight Talks. Today I'm joined by my twin sister, Lillian, and we're going to talk about all the different ways that autism affects our lives. Um, please check out the website autism.com where you can check out my blog where I write about living with autism. Uh, we have support group, parent support group meets tomorrow. Um, and the adult support group meets next Thursday. We also have Life Map and all these other great things. So check out artism.com for more about what we do. I also do these live streams every week, next week at 7 o'clock on Wednesday, Pacific Standard Time. I will have Alex on and we will talk about PTSD. This week I'm joined by Lillian and we're going to talk about how autism affects our lives. And so thank you guys for joining. If you have any questions, please leave them in a comment and we'll get to them as soon as we can. Um, so Lillian, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit because you haven't been on in a while. So like tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, I'm Lillian. I'm one of the founders of Autism. Um, I really enjoy researching and learning things. Um, I've been very into theater my whole life, and that's where I learned most of my basic social skills. Um, I've been through a lot of um, programs for people on the spectrum, um, trying out different things, finding what works for me. Um, yeah, so, uh, you just got a question? Twins. Yeah. twins. We are twins. Yeah. We were both diagnosed with autism when we were 16. Um, before that is a whole other journey of <laughs> figuring things out. But, we both have autism and it affects us both very differently. In some ways it's very similar, in other ways it's very different. So I thought it'd be a cool subject to talk about all the ways that autism really affects everyone, but two examples of how those things can affect a person very differently. So uh, we have a list of things. <laughs> Um, so I thought we, we could start with um, special interests because I feel like that's an important subject that gets talked about but not as very in depth and I think that it's talked about in a very positive way but I think that there's also like a very negative reason why we cling to special interests. I think it, for me it was because I didn't have friends or other things going on that I really dove into a subject and learned all about it because I really didn't have, it was like any, I didn't really have much else. I wasn't going to birthday parties and others and play dates and stuff. So instead of moping around and being depressed, it was a coping mechanism of here's a project to do to spend my time on so I wasn't thinking about all the other things and she also had a special interest but ours were very different from each other what we focused on when I was little we both read a lot but the way we read was very different the subjects we covered why we did it was very different she got really into acting and performing and I was very much into more art since she was very into research and into science and I was more into literature and writing and that kind of stuff but like I, my first special interest was was reading and I would read uh, books and I would carry the books with me and I would pretty much only talk about my books and it was a way it was a subject I knew all about and it wasn't vulnerable and it um, so when I talked to someone, it wasn't personal, and so I never felt attacked. They're like, "Oh, I don't like the book or the subject that you're talking about." And then when someone did talk to me about it, and I trusted them, and they didn't judge me, then I would talk about more personal things. And that's sort of how my mom and I connected. Is she started reading those books with me? And I mean, 
she did very similar stuff. You can talk about acting, how you use acting, because that was really cool. So for me, acting was so I could socialize better. It was really, I mean, I enjoyed it and there was all that stuff, but um, it was one of the safest environments for me because I was able to ask the questions that I couldn't ask in a normal social interaction. So if you're in the midst of an actual social interaction, most people find it uncomfortable or rude to ask why they're doing something, especially when it comes to negative emotions. So to ask someone why I personally made them sad or angry or what's happened to cause that created more discomfort or anger toward me so to ask in the acting world in theater was perfectly normal to go why is this person feeling this emotion in this scene and it was then explained to me in a way i could comprehend and then apply it out in the real world and i could also learn facial expressions how to use them myself how to read them on other people things like that were very easy to learn in the theater world because that's what everyone is learning um i enjoyed learning why people did things because i always said like the golden rule is what i followed treat others the way you wanted to be treated i quickly learned that didn't work for me because the way i wanted to be treated made other people really upset they didn't like when i did that so it's not treat others the way they want to be treated is my the rule i follow which i think is actually like a platinum rule that's i forget where i heard it before but that's a thing oh, that anyway, just, you just didn't talk about that yeah um so i do like that that is a thing that is now being taught in the world um and that is a much more accurate way to do it um and then as we got older and electronics became part of our world, we that became our new special interest. Like there was a lot you could read online and research. And um, we were able to create characters in different platforms where you could pretend to be that character instead of yourself and learn social interaction that way. And then when you have something like a video game where you like you were into Minecraft and stuff like that, where I didn't really enjoy that, but like I get what well, in that sort of game where you only talk about the game, like you don't talk about your personal life because it's not safe to talk about what's happening in real life. And so the rules of social interaction are they're they're straight out and easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And so, and then if there's an issue where like everyone you're having trouble with everyone you can just create a new character a new profile and try again and so i know you did more minecraft and i did more like we also did like poop pets and webkins and club penguin and all of that kind of stuff where you were characters mm -hmm. um i liked the ones where like you raised the animals <laughs> more so or like writing stuff where you buildings and puzzles and like a little bit more video game stuff than I did yeah and I also would go over to guys houses and play video games with them uh, I didn't often like following the rules of the video games which interested the people I was with like some people got really irritated and those weren't the people I really hung out with they stopped inviting me over but we would explore the world and they would teach me things and like i could ask questions about the video game and they were it was a comfortable way to interact socially where you can ask why is this character doing this what do they want in this scene and usually i could get an answer from my peers rather than asking an adult and, and that was a really cool way to socialize and learn things about other people and i enjoyed video games and i wasn't amazing but i got decently good at it so it was something fun and then we did like rock band as a family um and a lot of we stuff that was more like exploratory and not so much competition based because we're very not very comp uh, competitive people we don't like competition very much um so those sort of games were more ones that interested us
than one where you had to like win and compete Animal against someone. Animal Crossing Nintendogs. <laughs> I like those. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we, all, but we also, like, had Super Smash Brothers and Mario Kart and all that. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. like, we like the Animal Crossing stuff, that kind of stuff more. And then I was also into, like, very sciencey stuff because it helped me explain the world in a way that I understood it easier. Mm-hmm. Because understanding socially and those dynamics was very hard. But if it was explained in a scientific term, I got it. I can understand it. And it made the world much easier to handle if I knew the science behind something. The psychological chemistry of the brain rather than the emotional capacity of what was going on in the specifics of the social interaction. So, yeah, what the special interest they often can be used in in negative ways such as like being taken away from the person as punishment or given to them as a reward and I really don't think that's a good idea because it's sort of like taking away someone's um meditation or like you know like that that outlet where you can self-regulate and learn it's more to me, it was more of a need than it was um, anything else. It wasn't a want. It was, I am I need this right now. And so it was very difficult when that was taken from me. And it's something that I've talked with my parents about. And it, they um, have regretted making that, that choice when I was younger, but they didn't know. Um, so if like obviously if they're using their special interests in an unhealthy way that is self-destructive then it's not a good idea they continue with it but there has to be a replacement of something that is healthy or to just have that taken away especially without a transition we'll get into transitions in the future Transitions are really important. So when something like abruptly is taken away, whether it's it is a need or like even not a need, that can be really disruptive to someone on on the spectrum. We have a little bit of trouble with transitions if they're not done correctly, which could cause a meltdown. Um, let's see what else can we talk about? Should we talk about communication a little bit? Um, because we both have different areas we struggle with communication mm-hmm. so and i want to address one of the myths about autism is that we don't have empathy which makes communication very difficult and i don't know if people are using the wrong word but empathy is one of the most difficult things for any human to do empathy is feeling another person's emotion sympathy is addressing someone else's emotion and so and there are people called empaths which i think a lot of people on the spectrum are think, actually empaths i think it's a lot more common to be an empath on the spectrum than a narrative yeah and i love using the example of spock from star trek he's an empath even though he he doesn't like talking about emotion addressing emotion but he's able to connect with his vulcan mind trick where he he connects with a, another creature and is able to feel what they're going through know their thoughts and all that and i those of us on the spectrum really do feel the energy of other people whether we we know that's an emotion or not we're able to feel that and emotions are very they're overwhelming for us on the spectrum because they're very um physical when we feel it it can be like physically painful physically overwhelming we have physical reactions such as stimming and melting down and um all those kind of things so when we're around someone who's very emotional it it, it can be really uncomfortable and then also identifying what that emotion is can be difficult because a lot of us on the spectrum suppress our emotions and we we don't 
we we don't want to feel them because there's so much and so identifying what an emotion what emotion is happening especially because we don't understand body language tone of voice and all those little nuances as well as a neurotypical does because we're very straightforward people and we don't we don't like to beat around the bush we don't like small talk we don't like that kind of stuff we're it's we're very straightforward people and so when we go oh how are you feeling and someone says oh i'm fine we take that as oh they're fine when their whole body language could be telling a neurotypical person the opposite we don't always pick up on those nuances those they have to be taught to us and so if we're not in a mindset where we can observe that it's very difficult and there's different people on the spectrum have an easier time learning about the world of emotion than others and body language than others and tone of voice than others where my sister Lily is real is better at identifying other people's emotion than i am but not necessarily she doesn't necessarily know what to do with that information where I'm not very good at identifying the emotion, but I know what to do with it with the information once I have the information of what the other person is going through. So we like go feed each other and help each other out in those areas. Um, and like when we were little, we have a lot more examples because now we can go here's where we have our hindrances. And so if you ever do something like this, we're not gonna understand, and people can help help us <laughs> you know when we were little we didn't know what we didn't know and so i know you have a few stories of not picking up on sarcasm and stuff like like that if you want to explain some of that um yeah so there's been plenty of times in my life where someone will say sarcastic comments and i just totally miss it um vague language is very hard for me i always say specificity of language is like the most important thing for me um i get very confused easily by vague language and um broad terms and often we like to define our terms which there is a dictionary definition of things but everyone also has their own definition of things that are more broad, um, more personal. So to ask those things so everyone is on the same page really creates a much more universal dialogue or at least they understand what the person themselves is trying to say to me, even if they're not saying what I think they're saying correctly. Um, it becomes a much easier conversation when you define terms and ask people what they mean by certain words in certain language. Um, you know, one of the things that is difficult for me is when someone tells a joke, like how, how understanding if it's a joke or they're serious about it, especially here in America, we're very sarcastic people. And so I, I know that there's been times where I was like, Wait, were, were you sarcastic? And they're like, oh, no. And then they'll be sarcastic with their answer, like, of course I'm serious. And then I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I think they're serious. And I don't pick up on that. They're making a joke or being sarcastic. And um, the there's um, autistic jokes that are very different from neurotypical jokes like we have our own sort of culture where we we um tell jokes that are are more literal like my favorite my favorite is um that i can get that, that i making fun of myself i found these like very literal jokes one of them is like what did the farmer say when he lost his tractor where's my tractor <laughs> <laughs> Those are, because that's the way we think and so a lot of jokes go over our head because they're like we're like what that doesn't make any sense because they're so more a little bit more logical and so I've met people for the first time 
And over time, like when I get to know a person, I can tell more of those nuances about them. But when I first meet someone and I don't know anything, a lot of people like to introduce themselves with a joke. And I've thought that some of the people I met are were so mean. <laughs> I didn't understand why they would say these things. And later on, I realized everything they said was a joke. <laughs> and so that's really interesting. Like I'll watch comedies with with people and I'll think it's, very serious or I'll watch very serious stuff with people and I'll think it's really funny so we just have like different emotional reactions to to things um we laugh at different things we cry at different things but it it doesn't mean that we don't have the empathy that someone else is going through something different we just don't know that someone's going through something different unless they they tell me and then I can go oh I'm so sorry, I didn't know that you were upset, but I I feel bad that you're upset. Like, I know how that feels to be upset. Um, so I can definitely have empathy and sympathy for people who are different. <laughs> Hi, Zoe. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, so Kat says, my daughter says she tells people what she thinks they want to hear to end a conversation. Um. I don't know if that's quite autism. I feel like that's more of a lack of confidence. Um, um, and there's some people that just want to please other people. Um, but I don't know. I have a hard time guessing what other, what I, what other people want to hear. So if she knows, good on her. <laughs> um, uh, I had so much trouble with that that I. I've been so selectively mute in situations because of that. Whereas, like, I just don't know what to say. I can't say anything. Um, where I really had an inability to speak. Or she, she never really had that. <laughs> she mm -hmm. likes to speak her mind, which I um, admire. But she's like, I don't have any other choice. But I don't know. I think it's courageous that she's able to just genuinely say what's on her mind. I like that she does that. She has lots of them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I just I just want to address not necessarily that you're doing this, Kat, but like not everything about a person will always relate to their autism. And a, a, a lot of people on the spectrum tend to have low confidence in social situations, which is a component, like it's, because of autism that it they have the low confidence but the low confidence affects them differently than their autism does if that makes sense where being autistic and being shut down a lot because you're not understanding a situation being told you're wrong over and over and over can make someone feel insecure in social situations and give them social phobias and low confidence and all those kind of things where they they worry about things that aren't necessarily reality and will give them different um worries that cause them to react differently which doesn't necessarily come from autism it comes from more of a low confidence place where with autism we're addressing how autism affects communication um i hope that makes sense um, so with, with autism, there's often not understanding tone of voice, body language, and those kind of nuances, uh, facial expression, um, so things that aren't like literally stated verbally, um, even figures of speech can be hard. So if you're not outright saying, this is what I'm feeling and this is what I'm saying, then those, the then you could have, then your autism could affect a, a communication. Um, over time, you can learn those nuances, but it doesn't come as easily, like you have to consciously think about it and go, oh, is that facial expression a sad one, a happy one? What is this body language telling me? What is, 
is their tone of voice higher pitched? That means they're more excited. So it's like stuff that you have to research and keep, have memorized and be thinking about in order to understand that. So it takes a lot of energy for social interactions because of that. Um, and then also things like lack of eye contact and all that stuff, um, which has to do with more sensory and processing issues, can also affect uh, social interaction because we don't also don't display the things that we don't recognize. Um, that that comes from practice, <laughs> which Lillian did acting, and so she does. She's like out. So she says that she's good at acting because she practices on the daily. <laughs> yeah. And like facial expressions don't come naturally. I have to think about what I'm feeling and then express it on my face. So because I pass with my expressions every day, I'm not acting as pretending, but I'm showing the emotion inside of me. So to be able to do that on stage or on film is easy because I'm doing it every day is putting on a facial expression to match the emotion I'm feeling. I remember being at Disneyland when I was little and my mom would ask me if I was enjoying myself and I would, I would just keep saying like yes like obviously and she for and I didn't understand why she wasn't picking up on I was happy when she was picking up on that my little sister was and that other people were and that she had to keep asking me and then someone told me oh you smile when you're happy I was like I didn't know that <laughs> and then she would look at me and go are you having a good time yeah I'm having a really good time <laughs> and that's how I um started learning and now it comes more naturally when but it didn't at all when I was little and it was something I had to learn and practice and learn how to mask. Yeah. So now it's almost second nature that the minute you register your happy a facial mm -hmm. expression will then come to you. So it's but it's trained into us, so it's not always mm -hmm. there. So it'll be something like if your whole life every time you heard a bell, you raise this arm, all of a sudden the minute you hear a bell, mm -hmm. your arm will go up. Oh, but sure. But that's trained into you, and then on a day you might be feeling sick or tired, that arm won't go up, even though you heard the bell. So it's not always perfect, and then sometimes it doesn't go up all the way. Sometimes you quite you miss it and you do it wrong, um, and that's how we train our facial expressions. It's not quite the same as. Uh, neurotypical and then it also means we have to register the emotion we're feeling so if we think we're feeling one emotion and we're not because sometimes you don't get your emotions correct um, you can register on someone else who doesn't register what they're feeling you can, neurotypicals can say oh they're making that facial expression they're feeling this and then know that they're feeling that even if the person themselves doesn't know they're feeling it mm -hmm. if I don't know I'm feeling an emotion you will never know I'm feeling that emotion because I can't betray it if I don't know I'm feeling it. Yeah, and days where I'm like really drained of energy, like on my period, <laughs> like on my period, or like when I'm sick, or like stuff like that, I won't think about showing my emotion as much. And so I normally on, on days I have, um, on just normal days, I tend to try and smile more because I know that makes people comfortable. So when I see someone that I'm familiar with, I go, hi, and stuff like that, where on days where I don't have that energy, I'll just be like, hey, and I'm not registering that I didn't smile. And they're like, oh, are you okay? Are you sad? I'm like, oh, no, I'm not. And they won't believe me because my face is not showing that emotion. And so it is some. so I, I know it's something that it, it's not 100% accurate that I do it every time, but I, I try my best. Because <laughs> it just makes people more comfortable. But it would be nice if, like, there is a generation in the future that didn't have to do that. Because that is more, it's a more natural state, and it takes so much less energy to socially interact. And if you just, like, ask, like, hey, tell me how you're feeling. I want to know. They'll just tell you. <laughs> um where it seemed like people are just more comfortable when I show it. So it, it became just 
natural for me to do that. And guys naturally don't show it as much. Um, yeah, it's more acceptable for a guy not to show their facial expressions or what emotion they're feeling. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things that girls on the spectrum mask a little bit more than the guys do. So. And also it'll change for me who, who I'm hanging out with. If I notice someone's more comfortable around mm -hmm. me when I'm not doing that or more accepting of me, then I might do it less around them. I know I do it. I use facial expressions a little less around my family, um, especially around Chloe, because she can just pick up my emotions mm -hmm. on slight things because she knows me so well. Um, so, because you just still want to express emotions so people know it. There's a double thing there. Um, but if I don't feel like expressing, I don't need to express it. There, I don't, depending on who I'm with, I might not do that. Um, there are around strangers, I'm actually more likely to use bigger expressions and express myself more um, oh, than sure. around people I know really well because they get more comfortable with actually who I am and not expressing every little thing I'm mm -hmm. feeling. Um, and people tend to be more comfortable once they get to know you. And then I tell them, like, just ask me if you really don't understand my expression. My natural expressions would be nice to know, even if they're incorrect, um, yeah. for you to understand. I'd rather not she, put in the effort. Yeah. And she knows that my genuine smile plus is the one that I'm trying to do to make people comfortable. She's like, your natural expression doesn't reach your eyes, where, like, your eyes, because I learned, if you crinkle your eyes right here, it's a more um, it, genuine expression. So I do that on purpose. <laughs> Where when it's more natural, that doesn't happen. <laughs> and so she noticed that oh, I'm giving away my secrets. <laughs> so people are going to know. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so th that's why a lot of people on the spectrum find social interaction very tiring because it's a very conscious thing to think about all these things while you're trying to think about what to say and what the other person's saying and um, especially when you have things like a party where there's a lot of people how that can get overwhelming and then adding sensory input and all the other things <laughs> it's a very exhausting world to live in and when you lived in it long enough without thinking about it you some of these things you just like don't even realize you're doing mm -hmm. and so subconscious i know definitely when i was little and especially before my diagnosis at 16 i thought this was how everyone did everything i had no idea that no one else had to train their face had to learn um how other people interact, why people yeah. are doing what they're doing. I thought everyone was as clueless as me, which is why I was so frustrated with myself and angry at myself all the time. Because I'm like, everyone could do this. Everyone could go to a party and they have fun. Why do I go to a party and feel miserable? That's mm -hmm. not like something's wrong. I need to figure out what it is. Um, and then once I got my diagnosis, I was like, no, it's because they don't actually feel miserable. They're actually enjoying themselves. They're not putting in the effort I'm putting in so now I know and now I can compensate for that and go to places that are more comfortable for me that maybe a party like atmosphere is not the atmosphere that I would enjoy so I'll go for people that I'm really close to and spend a little time there but it's not something that will ever be I want to go to a party for fun it's um I'm obligated to go to this party I'm gonna enjoy it as much as I can being around people I love but that's not my atmosphere and that's fine for me and I understand that now. Mm -hmm. And I know for you, figures of speech were a lot harder for you than they were for me. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I still can't yeah. comprehend a lot of it. So figures of speech, just so you know, are things like cats out of the bag, it's filled the beans, you know, like things like that, that don't necessarily literally say what you're talking about. They use an example of like, a symbol or something like that um so when i remember the cat out of the bag really upset you for a long time when i tried to explain it, it was like a secret escape you're like no one should put cats in bags that's terrible oh i would get so angry at people for saying that because i really thought that 
someone put a cat in a bag. And I was like, what is wrong with you? Never do that. Um, I, I couldn't comprehend that it meant something else. And people kept trying to explain it to me. And I'm like, no, but they're saying they put a cat in a bag and then let it out. I'm like, why was the cat in the bag in the first place? Don't do that. It was really hard for me to then understand that people have these phrases. Um, I know my dad would say, I have my eye on you. And I always ask, which eye? What do you mean? Uh, <laughs> just one? How do you do that? It, it was always a question I always asked him every time he said that. I couldn't understand. Oh, yeah. My mom had the eyes in the back of her head, which I, terrified me. And do, dad would put his sunglasses back there. And so I remember when we were little, we would, like, look through his hair to find, figure out where his eyes were. Yeah. When he was sleeping, we'd be like, where's his eyes? <laughs> And so, so I know, like, there's a lot of times where there'll be a conversation between a neurotypical and someone on the spectrum. Like, oh, I clearly explained to this person, and they're not listening, and they're ignoring me. It's like, well, if you didn't say it in a way they understood, then maybe they're trying to do what you asked of them or what you communicated to them, but they didn't understand. Like, one of the things... For example, my mom would say, hey, did you clean your room? Yeah, I cleaned my room. And then she'd go up to my room, and it was a mess. And she's like, well, you did it. Why did you lie to me? I'm like, I didn't lie to you. What are you talking about? And what I realized, she was, she was asking me, is, did you finish cleaning your room? And I just heard, oh, did you clean your room? Yeah, I started cleaning it. I did some. <laughs> and so those nuances really threw me where it's like other people really assumed like she was asking did you finish where well, i didn't get that like mm -hmm. in the context of the sentence i was just like that yeah i cleaned it i did it um so oh so Zoe asks, what advice would you have for parents when their young children are super rude? You know they are unpacking, yet fear kicks in the kids are disrespectful and grow up that way. Sounds so literal. Um, I think I need an example. My son is so, so literal. I love it. I said one day money for jam and then I had to explain no. Okay, so I will say that I was a very, very rude child. Um and my mom thought I was a terrible person. <laughs> she really did. And I know you just told people I was stupid. Yeah. Because uh, I didn't understand I was being rude. Well, I, no. When I didn't have, this is yeah. when we were really little. I didn't have the language little, yeah. to explain all of this, what I'm telling you. So I said, I told my friend, she's, she's stupid. She doesn't know how to be nice. And then they, everyone just was like, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but if you help him understand um he's a boy right yeah. son um help him understand what he's doing to upset people eventually like he will learn it it will take a while for him to understand that other people think differently as i said you learn here's how i'm feeling here's how i should treat other people because they want that for me honesty is more important than feelings so for me i will don't get upset. Say I worked really, really hard on my acting. If someone came up to me and went, that show, you just did a terrible job, that would never upset me. I'd be like, oh, I need to work harder. What did I do wrong? Those are my personal feelings. So thinking that other people felt the same way as me, treat others the way you want to be treated. Honesty is more important than telling them they did a good job. I did that that then hurt other people's feelings and I wasn't aware. I needed that explained to me. So if you ask your child why they do things, they might be able to say why and tell you, well, I feel this way, so they must feel that way. And then explaining to them that other people are different and need to be treated differently. Um, and it may take many times of re-explaining it till they comprehend that. I think 
a better way instead of um, using like real life situations that your kid is yeah. in because they're too close to it it's watching movies tv shows reading books with them mm -hmm. and talking about what's your favorite character let's talk about the social interaction did you understand why this character got upset that kind of thing what what do you admire about your favorite characters are they nice are they like how do they treat others like all those kind of things will help where if you were like in a social yeah. situation with and he said something rude and you're like that's rude you're hurting that person's feelings he'll defend himself and be like no i'm not rude what i like if someone said that to me i wouldn't be upset and like he would be you can cause defense mode with that yeah. because he'll be corrected so often in his life about those things yeah use characters that do especially something. at a young age when he's still figuring out emotions and tone of like he doesn't know any of that yet like he has to learn all of that um and he's gonna learn it like as he gets older he's not gonna be stuck there forever he's gonna progress in social situations if he continues and wants to learn and wants to figure it out he will progress it's not going to be stuck there especially if he's in a defense mode state once he's out of there he'll be able to do so much more so mm -hmm. um i think my best advice is to wa watch movies tv shows book, read books those kind of things because it really simplifies social interactions into something that is very easily understood by children and those on the spectrum because it's real life is super 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 complex we're on tv it's especially with cartoons and with uh characters their facial expressions are so clear like what emotion that character is feeling and going through and the social interactions are so simplified that it's easy to like go back and watch it and go okay what is this character feeling what are they going through i wouldn't like make it a lesson unless he's like oh can you mm -hmm. explain this to me but i would do okay what do you admire about this character which one's your favorite character and have like a fun discussion about what's happening in, in um we love to analyze um films and stuff and and if you make that like you watch a certain TV show together as a family and then talk about it afterwards. Yeah, just say, I loved how this yeah. character did this. It made me feel this way. Mm -hmm. They made this person feel that way. And that's just something I admire about people. And just talking that sort of way has really opened up mm -hmm. a lot of discussions. And there are shows that explain that stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, I think Grow Meets World and shows mm -hmm. like that that have those life lessons. Um, and we had so many shows like that, which I don't think there's enough today. Mm -hmm. Like we had Boy Meets World and we had Power Rangers and we had stuff where like they really explained those situations on the show and then we could further talk about it. Um, and then they had like the fun Power Rangers like fighting <laughs> stuff as well. But there was a social interaction where like there'd be like someone who's who has a is afraid of heights and then they have to do something where they face that fear and all all the other characters are trying to support them and then we talk about like why were they afraid of that and then they're like they had a backstory about it and you're like okay this is what people do when they're they're afraid um and that kind of thing i hope that helps <laughs> answer your question do you record and archive these live videos if so where can we look at yes they're all saved if you go to artism and click videos they're all there. So you can see all the past ones Artism we've done. Facebook. Artism Facebook. It's on Facebook if you're not on Facebook. <laughs> um, thanks, Lillian. We have very open and honest conversations with our kids. It's hard for the kids. They're, um, they're, the son is eight, the daughter is seven, and so young. Great tip, Lily, about mentors and characters and what they admire. They still want to figure it out. I feel so much lighter. Thank you. Sometimes a mom just needs to hear they won't be stuck there. Yeah, they won't for sure. Uh, they're going to progress, especially if it's something they care about, which I feel that they do because they want to have friends and they want to, you know, do things with other people. And if mm -hmm. they keep bumping their head, they'll work on it. Yeah. Um, and the, they'll have that. these discussions with teachers, with peers, mm -hmm. with just interacting to learn things and it's i mean this is 22 years of experience for us it's yeah. not it's not learned overnight I, 
we have to go through this constantly. I'm still learning new things about social interactions because mm -hmm. that whatever programming comes with other human beings is not in there. <laughs> and it and really it's, uh, sucks because each stage of your life, new rules come into play. So mm -hmm. elementary school, very different rules. The middle school, middle school, very different rules. And high school, and then college, and then out of college, and then depending on where you live and where you work and who, who you're around, they're all different. It's so different. Um, mm -hmm. And then again, the so, differences between males and females mm -hmm. is a large part why females tend to learn it faster and sooner. Um, because males, is, at a young age, boys are very open to differences because they're the games they play the things they're into are much more important a lot are much more important podcast because you were more in the male world and i was yeah. more in the female world so we kind of understood the two worlds yeah the male world that if you're good at sports you're good at video games whatever they're into they don't care about social interaction as long as you can do that it's accepted females if you're you're playing games where socializing is the most important part of it you don't you can't socialize with people you're stigmatized you're not invited they can't interact with you so i just went with boys it was much easier while i learned all these things i was very interested because i was a girl i was exposed to that girl world and i felt stigmatized guys don't quite feel stigmatized until they're older and those games and sports and whatever are no longer involved in those social interactions once you reach that middle school, high school age is when they then have to catch up to the girls who've been doing it since kindergarten. So there is that difference, which I don't know if there's a better way or not better way. It's just the way that tends to be growing up. And so I've always found it easier to hang out with guys because that stigma is they just accept you much easier and you don't have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. um, For sure. Yeah. And then you reach the dating phase and then you start all over again. Like you were, I don't know if there's a quick topic, topic we can talk about. <laughs> Everything's like, I <laughs> only covered like two topics. Yeah. And I have a whole list. <laughs> so we'll continue this. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about scripting because and echolalia because that sort of has to do with communication as well. So scripting is a tool often used that is um, either rehearsing what uh, what you're gonna say or saying something to someone. So if you're like asked a question about um, something, you take that. What, what you said and go, oh, I really like that. And the response has been good to that and using that same phrasing again. So it's saving that. And so when you're in that situation again and someone asks you a similar question to what you were asked before, you can pull up that script and just, it's like you had memorized it as a character. And it's like, here's my answer. And this will always be my answer to that question. That's what scripting is and the echolalia um, can be confused with scripting because it can be using it's but it's using other people's words as your own and So it can be from a movie a TV show It can be literally repeating what someone's saying and echolalia can also be used to process information So if someone says something to you, you might need to repeat it in order to process it This often happens if you are a slow processor so instead of asking the person to repeat it so that you can pro properly process it, you might say it yourself. And so, you know, you would, and it's oftentimes with echolalia, you, you don't even know you're doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they're, so they're like verbal stems. Um, so like she, she would be in lectures in class and be repeating the lecture out loud <laughs> and get in trouble with like, are you mocking me? And that kind of stuff where it, is, um, and an echolalia could also be just copying someone's accent, tone of voice, the way they say things. So everyone has a way that they talk. And echolalia, when you're responding to them, could just be repeating that because 
with autism, we often copy what the other person is doing in order to make them comfortable. So if someone is brushing their hair behind their ear a lot, we might start doing that because we want to make the other person comfortable so we'll copy them. And one of the things we might start doing is copying the way they talk. And so if someone comes with an accent from a different country, Lillian often starts mimicking, echoing. Okay. There's different reason behind that than the, comfort. Yeah. For me, it's processing. No, but that's often the yeah. reason. Yeah, it's often it, some people have, but mine is just I can't process an accent uh, until it's mm -hmm. in me. So, so like, to yeah, process it, my echolalia comes out. Well, no matter what yeah. e e you're echoing, those are the two reasons you do it, either to make yeah. the other person comfortable or – um to process and both could be you can be conscious of or not conscious of so you may be aware or not aware that you're doing something or it could just be a stem that makes you comfortable yeah so there's it makes you comfortable rather than the other person so there's so much going on that with social interaction that we're either thinking about or not thinking about that can either help or hurt us. <laughs> um, and it really depends on the person. My daughter speaks in many accents. She started doing it when she was three. We are Australian and she spoke like she was from England. Okay, so Australian is also a really interesting one. Um, yeah, it's, it's a, there's a couple countries where if they speak a couple languages, someone with autism will only speak one of them or the accent's actually too difficult for them, so they'll use other accents. In America, it's really um, mm -hmm. Or they're exposed to a lot of a different culture and start using words or accents from that culture, such as if they're watching a lot of TV from England, then they'll copy that, that accent, especially younger people. Um, and then they'll hold on. If they've learned... A lot of their language also from there then they'll keep those phrases and as they get older and so they'll go into that accent when they're saying certain things so they learned it in that accent yeah um also for me i have the processing echolalia i don't have the australian accent when i'm speaking to someone with the australian accent i it's not something yeah. my brain processes as an accent because there is no pattern to it like other mm -hmm. accents it's very just words are just spoken randomly differently um so i don't know the reason your daughter might be speaking these but it, she could she might be unable to process the accent and is just finding words that fit better an accent that seems more patternized because we seek out patterns and australian accent does not have a distinct pattern that's recognizable Mm -hmm. so it's very hard to process um both speaking it and understanding it i don't know if and it's it's a really common thing for people on the spectrum to have american accents from australia i don't know the whole entire reasoning behind it but that is and I'm thinking it's the non-distinct pattern that our minds seek out patterns so much and there is no pattern in that accent. There's also like those with autism from Japan will refuse to speak Japanese mm -hmm. and will only speak English um, because Japanese is too hard for them as they can't understand the nuances of the language. Chinese can be similar where there's like a couple languages or different dialects of Chinese language, and they'll only speak a, a certain one. Um, not, I think Australian is an accent that the low spectrum don't like, and then I think um, there's a couple other ones. Tony Outwood talked about. Um, I can't the remember American them, accent. but I know like a lot of the American accents are really easy to echo. Um, the I know I had a lot of family from Boston and so I echoed a lot of the Boston accent when I was younger and I um and I echoed a lot of the English accent because we wa watched a lot of English shows um I think I, there was a little bit of the New York accent because I knew some people from New York but not as much but it was so much so that 
Um, I actually had people asking me where my accent was from. <laughs> and then on top of that, I had um, the tooth in the roof of my mouth, which gave me a lisp, and I couldn't say things like no, and so I said nar, which sounded very English or Australian, and so people couldn't quite place it because I would say that, and then I'd go to the Boston accent, and then I'd go to, into my Californian accent. <laughs> Um, and we're like, where are you from? I don't understand where this accent is from. I'm like, I'm from California. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I didn't pick up on that I was doing that. But she went into fully into one accent mm-hmm. at, one, at a time where I had different words from different accents. So it really depends on how the, the equilalia will affect you. But... It, it definitely affects a lot of people on the, on the spectrum. So they'll pronounce words which sound incorrectly, but they're actually from a different language or a different dialect, <laughs> um, accent. It's crazy. But yeah, there's a lot of those um, from Australia who have autism who cannot, who don't have an accent from Australia. It's from somewhere else. Which is super interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, but yet, I, I've i talked about that I, I really don't like the Australian accent. <laughs> like, I, I said, I think it's pattern seeking. Our minds are pattern really, and there's no pattern. Like, there's a lot of people talk about finding it attractive. And I'm like, really? It bothers me because there's no pattern to it. And I'm always like, why did they say that word that way? It just sounds like they're saying things wrong sometimes. <laughs> Um, but I understand it, and there's, like, I understand a lot more accents than some of my friends. Um, we were watching, um, Shameless, and what was the other one? Misfits, Misfits. which, um, were lesser known, um, uh, accents. See, one was Irish, and one was Welsh, I think, and we we really understood them so much and our friends were like, are they even speaking English? <laughs> it's like, yeah, they're speaking proper English. <laughs> Zoe says she takes no offense. <laughs> but the, yeah, there's certain accents that are, I really, I don't know, they bother me more than others. Not that I can't listen to it because like I've been watching um, some Australian shows and we watched um, some New Zealand shows that also bothered me a little bit <laughs> but we watched like the Saddle Club and they're like Power Rangers used to be from in New Zealand and mm-hmm. like I can listen to it it's not like so much that I'm like <laughs> but it's like <laughs> if I could choose an accent to listen to all the time it probably wouldn't be one, that one and then there's like a couple <laughs> others <laughs> I'm stuck on it. He's stuck, yeah. <laughs> I'm stuck on it. Um, um, that's the thing, getting stuck. Yeah, being fixed. Um, um, yeah, that also happens in Skin. There's a character that gets fixed. He has Asperger's. Um, and they, he talks about getting fixed or stuck, and the other characters will actually point it out to him so that he can <laughs> move on. Um, so if anyone has any last questions, we'll start wrapping up. I'd love to, to answer your questions. To me, it's so interesting what you're saying. It's just another piece at an early age. I didn't pick up on that. I love all this. Oh, thank you, Zoe. Yeah, so if anyone has any last questions, we'll answer them. We'll start wrapping up. Thank you, Lillian, for joining me. And I'm sorry okay. for talking so much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so she's really good at answering questions that I can't answer because <laughs> she knows about all these different other subjects. And she's going to come back and talk about transitions in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm excited to talk about that. So if you want to see her again, let me know because we, she should definitely come back. <laughs> um, so we have support group tomorrow. Yeah. So for the parents, go to autism.com if you want to go check out 
that for all the information. Uh, I have my blog up there where I talk about living on, on the spectrum. I should really update that. <laughs> uh, we, I have the workshop in January. I have information posted um, on my personal page and it's also on artism.com under events. It's on, I don't want to say it wrong. <laughs> well, um, we wish our parents did differently. Yes, I had the word differently and that was it. <laughs> parents, what we wish our parents did differently, it's with me and Danny Rady. It's located in California, Redondo Beach. Please come January 13th. It's a Sunday. It's pretty long. So the only requirement is that you want to be there and you can sit through it. <laughs> Otherwise, there'll be breaks. Yeah, there'll be yeah, <laughs> there'll be breaks. <laughs> um, so thank you guys for joining. Um, come back next week. Um, Alex Orler is gonna be back. Um, she has a a talk we did a while over the summer where she talked about AD, ADD, and she's coming back to talk about PTSD. So come back next week, Wednesday seven. Pacific Standard Time. Um, you can watch this. No, I'm going to get some comments. Oh, you have you comments? Can, yeah, I'm going to get some comments. Um, thanks, Lily, for standing in for me. Oh, yeah, Zoe's supposed to be here today. But she's, well, we schedule. She's coming back. <laughs> um, just wanted to say thank you for doing this. I know it's a lot to put yourself out there. Oh, thank you, Richard. <laughs> I'm sorry, Cammy, we're logging off, but thank you for joining. You can <laughs> watch it after it ends. It'll, in like five or ten minutes, it'll all be uploaded again. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Come back next week. Stay colorful.